Uh, we get a lot. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's hard to say live, and we're live actually right now. But usually about three to four thousand. Uh, you know, within I'll just week. stick to my nose and. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there you go, guys. All right, hey. Well, first off, for you guys tuning in right now, I want you to all look at the clock right now and realize it's about nine o five ish. Uh, the first time we started actually on time in the first like you know ten weeks here. Uh, so for you know, guys, welcome to the show tonight. Cheers. As you guys can already tell. Chris Smith, the other box down there, is not here tonight. He's going to be online on uh, Twitter, uh, just monitoring the social conversations. He's actually flying from New York to Utah for a speaking event. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into first call. I'm not going to get into any of the segments tonight. You know, we got a great guest, Derek Halpern, on tonight. And for me, I really wanted to just take this opportunity to pick Derek's brain and, you know, get his thoughts, his ideas, his strategies that could help you guys with your business. Derek is uh, the founder and really the main guy over there at socialtriggers.com, Social Triggers the company. Uh, and Derek, for those people who, who don't know what Social Triggers is, which is a, a large part of our audience, um, just give us a quick you know, 60 seconds pitch on what is Social Triggers, why'd you start it, and you know, what, what value do you bring each and every day to your audience? I can sum this up in like one sentence. That's easy enough. I show people how to get other people to do stuff. Whether it's rent an apartment, buy an apartment, buy a house. I show people how to just get them talking, sharing, buying. I show people how to do that. Yeah, and you and you and I were talking about this before before the actual broadcast. You know, the thing that I, I'm always drawn to, because I've I've been immersed myself in Derek Halpern videos and blog posts over the last three hours, uh, you're you're sort of the you are the master at I think really relating to someone on the other side of the screen, which is a very difficult thing to do because a lot of the marketing we do right now, Derek, is is very impersonal, right? There's a very big disconnect between the normal conversations that you and I are having right now and yeah. the way that we market to people. So, you know, today I wanted to get into, I wanted to get, oh, there's a ton of topics I want to cover, but I want to cover lead conversion, I want to cover lead generation, but I want to first start with something that I was actually really interested in, which is uh, website design. Now, your site, socialtriggers.com, is not going to win any design awards any t anytime soon. Whoa, but, wait, 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 wait. Why not? Well, I'm saying, like, in terms of your aesthetics, right? It's not aesthetic a... Aesthetic is beautiful. It's no, I'm, I'm saying if you were to be... Like, are you familiar with the site, awwwawards.com? Like, you know, it's like, it's there's no rotating images. There's no flash. Well, flash is a little outdated. But my point is... I didn't mean to insult your site in the first five minutes here. The point <laughs> is, is that... You know, your site is very minimalistic, right? Yeah. And you've done it for a very intentional reason. And I want you to just touch a little bit in terms of just your thought process when it comes to website design. Because again, if you, all the things we're going to be doing here, Derek, of driving people to our website through social, through email, through paid advertising, whatever it is, if they get on our website and it's terrible in terms of a user experience, it's ugly. Right, they're gonna they're gonna bounce off. Right, they're not gonna, they're gonna lose trust. And now you get some data on this too. So I just want to hear your thoughts about this because this is incredibly important. I think point to start at for us to discuss everything we're gonna talk about today. Yeah. So I want to just start off with a quote from Einstein, as cheesy as this may sound. <laughs> and the quote was, "Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler." That is why social triggers work so well. Because I don't have these stupid rotating banner images. I've actually done eye tracking tests and studies on this where I found that no one even clicks on those rotating images. Why have it there if no one's going to click on it? So I mm -hmm. took it away. I also pared down socialtriggers.com into the bare essentials because I want the content to be front and center. In addition to the content, I want the email sign-up form to be front and center. Why? Well, think about it. Well, the more traffic I get, the more, the higher that my website converts, the more emails I get to my list. The more emails I get to my list, the more revenue I make and the more people I help. And if my content is front and center, if there's no distractions to just the best content, what happens? I get more traffic because people are coming to websites to get more content. So my website may not win any of these fancy schmancy design awards, <laughs> but you know what? It should because I think it's beautiful and it works beautifully as well. Well, is there is there do's and don'ts you, you, you have when it comes to, like again, in the context of we have 
our audience is real estate agents, right? And if yep. you go to a real estate agent website, the first thing you see is a huge web, you know, headshot of themselves, right? And then yep. more or less accolades of why they're so great. Obviously, we can say, you know, our audience is pretty intelligent. They know that's not really the way they're going to go. Is there is there do's and don'ts you have in terms of best practices uh, for again our audience, salespeople who actually you know sell real estate? Is what are your thoughts there? The best practice for building any type of website design is to portray a couple of things. One, you want to appear trustworthy, right? So a lot of these real estate agents put their big cheesy smile on their website and then talk about their happenings. You know what? It's actually not a bad strategy. The issue is everybody does it. And if everyone is using the same exact strategy, you are in a position where you are going to blend in with everybody else. And what blends in gets ignored. So in this case, it's bad. You don't want to blend in with other people. So let me give you let me give you a little story. When I started socialtriggers.com back in March of 2011, I did an analysis of all the top marketing blogs on the web. At that point, many of these blogs had these magazine layouts. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of color, a lot of stock photography, yep. a lot of this stuff, a lot of a lot of noise. So I thought, you know what? I know from psychology that people need things to look different if they want it to be different. Things need to look different if they want it to be different. So I didn't want to create a magazine layout. I didn't want to bombard my site with all this noise. I wanted my site to be, as soon as someone stumbled on it, they already knew from the first second that it was different than everything else. It didn't blend in even in, in the slightest. So because things that look different are different. So that was the first thing. I did the minimalistic design as a way to stand out. Now take this back to real estate agents with their dumb, cheesy photos talking about their accolades. That blends in. What blends in gets ignored. However, if you look at socialtriggers.com, what do I do? I have a picture of myself in every single blog post. <laughs> you do. Yeah, it's actually true. But what's interesting about that picture? I well, you're smiling. I think if I remember I'm correctly. Smiling or I'm making myself look like an idiot. Yeah. I actually make myself look like a moron with, a, with what I call the unfortunate freeze frame alert. I do that on purpose. <laughs> you know why? Because I want to show people right from the get go that I've got good information. I don't take myself too seriously. And you know what? I'm here to put a smile on my face and yours. What better way to differ differentiate myself? So if you're a real estate agent, Instead of focusing on looking for the most professional picture of yourself possible, which is what everyone else is doing, try to make a funny face in one of them. Not only is are people going to grab your it's going to grab their attention, but it's also going to make you more relatable to people. And what's wrong with that? Yeah, and there's a really good example of that. There's and I wish someone on Twitter can tweet this out. The girls in Seattle who are two real estate agents, Derek, who actually interview each other. And it's yeah. very much along that same line where it's 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 like they 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 have a, a great natural rapport between each other where it's it's so not scripted and just yeah. very you know very just down to earth and it makes it approachable to the point where you would actually want to you you almost instantly feel this connection to that person which is kind of what you're talking about to a certain degree just with images alone. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly what I'm talking about. The whole point is you want to if you want to be known as being different, you have to look different right from the get go. It's just the way it is. So, and and, and the reason we're starting here, guys, for everyone tuning in tonight, and again, if you're on Twitter right now, you can follow us at at uh, Pound Water Cooler. Uh, the reason we're starting here with design is because if you have a terribly designed website, or or you 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 look the exact same as everybody else. Right, you're not going to be able to differentiate yourself whatsoever. And Derek, I know you have some stats on this in terms. I think there was something like I wrote down somewhere the University of London. You talked touch on a little bit, like what yeah. that what the impact is in terms of design for a website. Look at this. This guy's put, putting me on the spot, trying to make me remember numbers. <laughs> oh, you, I, listen, I actually, on, I, on this show, you can make it up. But don't worry. We'll, actually, we'll, I, I actually remember numbers, so it's fine. Okay. Luckily, I remember this. So there's a study done by Elizabeth Silence out in London. And they discovered that when they got together a bunch of research participants, right, they asked them to browse different websites. And then they asked those research participants, did you trust that website or did you distrust that website? Right? Simple question. If they trusted the website, to elaborate. Why don't you trust this website? And here's what happened. 
98% of the responses cited design-related reasons. Let me repeat that. When people stumble on a site and chose to distrust that website, 98% of the reasons why were design-related. Why is that? Well, they stumble on the site, if they're bombarded with a cluttered web design, too small a font, hard to navigate content, and all this stuff, People didn't even give your website a chance. They didn't even read one sentence. Before they even read one sentence, they already decided that they distrusted the website based on web design. Now, it's not about having a beautiful design, as I said. They distrusted cluttered and busy layouts. They distrusted sites that have navigation problems. They distrusted boring web design. Not mm -hmm. simple web design, but boring web design. They hated pop-up ads, and you know what? Everyone hates pop-up ads. I use them. I'll probably always use them, but <laughs> people hate them. But they, they work for you, though, right? In some con, and I, I want to get to that later because I don't, I don't want to forget about this. You you said something in one of your videos recently. This idea of you know being pushy at the right time, which yes. is years of years of pop-up ads. But we'll get we'll get to that. So keep going on web design here just for a moment because I want to learn more about the study here. Yeah. So pop-up ads, slow loading times are killer. If your mm -hmm. website takes too long to load, people are out. All right, I know I'm out. I can't even wait one second for a website to load before I'm closing that box. You know, they hate small font. They hate big blocks of text. Mm -hmm. All right, if you go to socialtriggers.com and look at my blog posts, you'll notice that I always use one sentence or two sentence paragraphs. Why? It's not necessarily the best writing method, but it's the best for the internet. It gets people reading. That's yeah, Jacob J Jacob Nielsen. I I used to read him. I haven't read him in a long time. But Jake Nielsen writes uh, the usability site. I think it's useit.org or useit.com, whatever it is. He talked about that, like you know how few words people are actually reading on a web page. It's like twenty eight percent of the words, right? And and the number decreases the more words you have in a blog post. And that's something that you do really really well, which is your content is very readable for the web. It may not translate well into to print or whatever else, but it translates exceptionally well into web. I have no idea if it translates in, well into print, but it does, it does for the web. So no, let's... Yeah. Let, no, on, I, sorry. Right, but just I want to say, long content doesn't necessarily doesn't get read. Like, people read long content as well. Don't make any... People... They always say people have short attention spans on the web, and here's the deal with that. People have shorter attention spans for bad content. Mm -hmm. If they're reading something that's gripping them by the throat and holding them on their screen, they're going to read every single word on that page. So it's not about length. It's about keeping it manageable. It's about keeping it, you know, keeping it appetizing. And people like small bites on the web. They don't want to have to read big blocks of text. I read the New Yorker. I love the New Yorker. I got a New Yorker right here, actually. Actually, this is not the New Yorker. Oh, no, it is the New Yorker. I you're, get you're, you're, you're from New York? I am from New York. So <laughs> I'm, jo I get, I'm, jo I'm joking. I can tell. Go ahead. <laughs> I get the New Yorker every week. And yes. you know what? Well, print magazines are dying, I love the New Yorker. And let me tell you, I read it. I love them. I cannot read their website. They use these big tech paragraphs, these weird-ass fonts, mm -hmm. and it's unreadable to me. Yeah. Why I subscribe? Maybe they make it unreadable, so I subscribe. Who knows? So, so, so. All right. So, you, you, so, and these are these are all incredibly important tips. And, and for me, it, this may sound obvious for some people who are who are watching the show right now. But if you go back to your own websites and you actually listen to what Derek's saying and compare what you actually have right now, you're going to see a, a stark contrast between the two. And these these seemingly obvious things like big font, simple, you know, simplifying the website, you know, providing great content. Uh, these are things that can't be reinforced enough. And so, Derek, I want to just transition into this idea of what you just mentioned, which is bad content doesn't get read. So long form versus short form is not really the conversations. It's good versus bad. And one of the things that real estate agents struggle with right now is this idea of, you know, when it comes to blogging or any type of content creation, they they struggle with creating content that actually converts. And we had Rand Fishkin from Moz on a few weeks ago, and he, you know his advice to us during that show. And he's a brilliant guy with lots of insight. He was more or less saying double down, if not triple down, into content creation. And what we didn't get to really discuss during that conversation with Rand was, you know, specifically as a real estate agent, what type of content should you be creating? So. Oh. Dude, this is the easiest question in the world. Let me tell you, I, I, I love this question because I've helped 
tons of real estate agents answer that. What, what, what do I create? What do most, re you know what, I, are people on Twitter at me right now, if you're on Twitter, at Derek Halpern, and tell me the type of content you think you should create, okay? And while you're tweeting me that, at, it's at D-E-R-E-K-H-A-L-P-E-R-N, tell me what type of content you think you guys should create. Let me wait a second while some of these people come in. And then while, that, while that's coming in, let me tell you the exact type of content you should create. Because everyone, and I don't know Rand personally, but everyone likes to say double down on content. Because it makes sense. It sounds good. But no one tells you what to create. Do you know why? Because these people don't know what to create. But I do. And I'm going to tell you what to create. The point of your content is to be useful to your ideal customer. You want your content to be insanely useful to your ideal customer. You want it to be so useful that after they read that article, they think, wait a second, I need to use this guy as my real estate agent. He just saved my life. Now, this is, this is a platitude. You know your content should be useful, so what should you write? Well, think about your ideal customer. What types of things or problems do they have that are going through their head that's not related to the real estate sale? Let's say you're a broker and you deal specifically with uh, rental apartments, right? You know mm -hmm. that people need to be put in a rental apartment, but what other problems do they have? Think about it. Maybe they have an issue with finding a trustworthy moving company. Maybe they have an issue with uh, finding a trustworthy junk removal company to get rid of their old stuff. Maybe they don't know how to find the perfect, most cost-effective storage company. Maybe they don't know how to transport a big couch outside of their house because it doesn't fit through their front door. Mm -hmm. These are problems that people who are moving have. Write the content that solves those peripheral problems. Don't write just, here's the new listings of the day. Yes. You should talk about new listings, but everybody talks about new listings. That's not going to set you apart. Instead, talk about these problems on the sidelines. Help them solve the moving company problem. Help them solve selling their additional house problem. Maybe they have to sell, to sell their house. Yeah. They need to make certain repairs. Like maybe you can write seven ways to get your house in sale ready. Like you know how, how to make your house sale ready. And just tell them, you know, put a new coat of paint here, replace this rug here, replace these things, and show them how to re up to kind of redo their house to make it more sellable with like a thousand dollars or something. This is a problem that people who are moving have. Solve mm -hmm. that problem, they're going to come to you for something else. So, so what? It, and, and that's excellent advice. And it, it's, it's it, again, this is it sounds obvious when you take away all the hype. And say, listen to your customers' problems and create content that essentially solves their problems because that's the way they're going to discover you online and help you build trust. Um, but you know, there's there's so much information out there when it comes to this stuff, Derek. That it's it's very easy to get caught up into the ticks and you know tips and tricks about you know the right amount of words, the right amount of keywords, the right amount of you know links to the site. Uh, and what you're uh, uh, there's no right amount of words, right amount. Of, where did I say focus on keywords or any of that? I said find a problem that people have and solve that problem. Don't worry about keywords. Yep. Don't worry about the right amount of words. Don't worry about SEO. How, how, many, how many times, and you have 100,000 people subscribe. And just to put in context for our, for our viewers, Derek has, I, would, I think I saw on your side, like 100,000 people subscribe to your newsletter, right? At, at, at any point during that process of you growing your, your, your email newsletter list, your audience just in general, did you ever go back and optimize specifically for SEO and I'm not talking sp like editing your headline to make it more attractive for people to click on. I'm talking specifically looking at keyword analysis and coming back and making any changes. Or did you basically throw that all away and just focus on people first? For the first two years, I focused on people first. Mm -hmm. I recently started doing a little bit of keyword stuff. Let me get, just to give you a little bit of my history. Before I was Mr. Social Triggers, I had a lot of consumer facing websites. I had a celebrity gossip site, a makeup site, a fashion site, a men's entertainment site. Did in 2007 about 30 million hits. All right, 30 million hits. How did I get those hits? Basically, all of it was SEO. I am an SEO guy at heart. I started on the web as an SEO guy, and here I am telling you, do not worry about SEO. 
It's a trap. And here's the reason why. You can optimize your keywords and all that stuff as much as you want. Okay, you can submit your articles to article directories. You can try and gain the search engines, but in the end, you'll eventually you'll eventually be found out. However, if you create content that solves these problems for people, these peripheral problems, people are going to feel indebted to you. It's mm -hmm. so useful that when a friend reads your article, they're going to remember it. And if they know a friend that's moving and has that problem, they're going to share your article with them before they even think to need someone like you. Let me give you another example. There's a, I, was, I was speaking at a conference. Someone raised their hand. They're like, well, Derek, how do I create content like, you know, that kind of talks about this stuff? And I always talk about solving the peripheral problems. And this woman raised her hand. She's like, all right, well, I help women recover from a, a marriage that went bad. I help women recover from a divorce. And I was like, okay, so what's your current email bribe? Like, you know, what kind of ebook do you give away for emails? She goes, all right, my current email bribe is seven ways to have a happy marriage. And I'm like, oh, that's very nice of you. How is your list? Is it building? She goes, yeah, it's building great. I was like, but is it converting? She said, no, it's not converting. Well, why do you think it wasn't converting? Because if you're giving away an email bribe that says seven ways to have a happy marriage, those people are not divorced. <laughs> Those people are trying to their marriage. So what I told her was, I was like, you're getting the wrong people on your email list. Mm -hmm. Instead, why don't you write an ebook that says like seven ways to find out if your husband is cheating on you? <laughs> yeah, that 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 would work really well. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, it, 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 it's well, it's 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 again. This is like this idea of slowing down and thinking about who your target audience is, right? You know, kind of working backwards from there in terms of you know how you want to reach them, and again the peripheral as you described, which is the first time I've heard anyone kind of describe it that way. Uh, the peripheral I are problems that you're trying to solve. It makes it makes a lot of sense. Now, is there is there some like specific semantics in terms of you know I, I read a post that you shared recently, uh, maybe not recently, like crafting the perfect blog post. Because what you're saying right now, if I'm if I'm a real estate agent, and I, I sell luxury real estate in Miami, like our friend Kevin Tomlinson. And I start taking some of these tips to heart, right? You know, I start writing content about you know ways to get the most for your money in Miami when buying over a million dollars, right? For example, yeah. um, you know, you 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 you've given some examples of ways to kind of capture people if you're going to be sharing this stuff socially or through email to pull them in. So when you talk about writing a perfect blog post, if you've got the content, right, and you know who your audience is, what are some of the specifics in terms of crafting a blog post that actually gets people to read it? That obviously is, is ultimately geared towards getting them to convert into a real client of yours. All right, you're gonna hate my response. Okay. <laughs> this is an example of something that you don't really have to worry about if you're being useful. Okay. If you want to learn about the perfect blog post, just Google perfect blog post. I created an infographic on it. It's free. No email opt-in required. Go read that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to focus you, right now. You're trying to get me to talk about something that might. You know, put a gold plate on a piece of shit. Yeah. Right? I'm not trying to gold plate a piece of crap right now. <laughs> I'm trying to give people the actual knowledge to create the right type of content that's going to make them tons of sales. Right. So, like, let's focus on this type of content thing for a second, and let's kind of just think. Let's think this through because I mean, I can talk about the perfect blog post all day, and that's a good tactic. But I don't want to talk about tactics. I want to talk about strategies that make real clients, like attract real clients. Let's talk about uh, a wedding planner. Let's say you plan weddings for a living, right? How would you get people who are going to be potential clients of yours? Well, first things first. Let's mm -hmm. start at the top. You want to write solve problems on the periphery. When you're thinking about those problems on the periphery, though, you want to solve problems that immediately precede the sale. Let me. Let me repeat that. Yeah. You want to solve periphery problems that precede the sale. So if you're a wedding planner, you you could write an article about how to find the perfect engagement ring. And that is a peripheral, that's a peripheral problem. The issue is thinking about buying an engagement ring is probably years away from when the wedding actually happens. It's not close enough. Yeah. Instead, you want to write an article maybe about seven ways to know if you're picking the best wedding caterer or something like mm -hmm. that. Or how to find the best wedding photographer. 
Or if you're a wedding photographer, you could even say, what shooting 200 weddings taught me about wedding food? You know what I mean? Like you could create all this stuff that precedes the sale immediately around the wedding, solve that problem, and they're going to look to you for what else you have to offer. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because in real estate, and you may not know this, but in real estate there was a big push a few years ago that was uh, focusing on community-focused content. And yeah. the example you just gave, Derek, was like community-focused content could literally be a year or two years or three years or more before that person buys or sells a piece of real estate. And what you're saying is it, at least maybe a starting point, and maybe you can expand from there, is get as close to the point of sale as you can or as like Google calls it, with a zero moment of truth, to get to that point of sale as you can and start creating content around that. That way, when they're at that critical moment and you're thinking about who am I going to call, who am I going to reach out to, they're finding you with this helpful information that is ultimately building trust. If I, if I understand you correctly. You are, that is exactly it. This is the stuff that people need to do. right? People are so worried about these tactics and all this BS. It's like, I just, I just moved into New York City about four months ago. Right? Let's let's forget websites for a second. All right? If you sure. want to be a successful real estate agent, you have to be a good person. Okay? And let me say why. Let me explain why I'm, I'm telling you this right now. Because four months ago, I'm looking for an apartment in Manhattan. Now, mm -hmm. you probably know apartments in Manhattan aren't inexpensive. They're actually very expensive. Right? I found the perfect apartment. In a, a, this wasn't through a real estate agent. I found it on the web by myself in a no fee like rental building, right? Sure. So I found the perfect apartment. Now you're all real estate agents so you know how rental buildings work. You usually have to deal with an internal leasing agent, right? So mm -hmm. I called this building, I talked to this leasing agent on the phone. It's one of the more well-known properties in Manhattan. Talk to him on the phone. I tell him, I was like, hey man, I really like this apartment and I'm willing to commit to this apartment sight unseen. I don't even need to see it. I want this apartment. What do I need to do to get this rolling? He goes, well, I need you to fill out the paperwork and then send it in. I was like, perfect. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm out on Long Island. I'm going to hop on the next train. I'm going to come to the office. I'm going to do it right now. We're going to close this today. Do you know what he says to me on the phone? I can't do it today. <laughs> no. No, he says, he goes, well, why don't you fill it out on the web and then email me it because I've got another customer who just called me before you and told me that he wants this place but he just landed. He's going to the airport right now. He's at, he's at the airport. He's going to his hotel room and he's going to submit it online and I don't want you to lose out on this apartment. I'm a sales guy. I train people how to get people to do things. And I, I listen. I was like, let's call him Tommy. It's like, Tommy, I know you're full of shit right now because not only did you give me a discount on the price that someone else is apparently willing to pay, you're now trying to get me to email this. You want me to email my social security number on email to you. I will come into the office right now. Let's not play games. Know what he says? He digs himself further into his hole and says, no, no, there's really another guy. He's really another guy. He's you just call me. You're going to lose it. Look, I'll give you $200 off the monthly rent. Just let's submit it online right now. And I said, Tommy, I basically said on the phone, I was like, look, man, I want to make this deal. Just stop fucking with me. I'm going to be there in 20 minutes. Let's just make this happen. And he goes, no, look, there's someone else. I'm like, all right, Tommy, well, what's his first name? He goes, his name was, let's say his name was John. He tells me his name. I was like, oh, John? How can he afford this apartment? What's his last name? He tells me his last name. I was like, all right, what's he do for a living? He tells me what he does for a living. Here's John Smith who does this for a living. I'm like, you just revealed your other customer information? Hold on. I Google him and find this guy's phone number. I call John on my phone and three-way him in. And I say, hey, John, I've got so-and-so on the line. He said you looked at this apartment and want it. Is this true? He goes, no. I said, I, I, first, how would you get my information? And second, I told him I had no interest in that apartment. And I said, Tommy, here you are. You're one of the most well-regarded buildings in Manhattan. And you just ensured that I will never live in your building because you are a dishonest person. 
Now, you would think it would stop right there. So I, I basically gave up the apartment of my dreams in this building because I hated this guy. I actually reported him to the management, and they offered me all these types of incentives as an apology. But regardless, I didn't go in that place. I got another guy. I found another perfect apartment. I already know the apartment I want. I called the broker up. I tell him, like, look, I want this apartment, this building. Let's get the deal done. You don't have to even do any work. You don't have to visit anything or show anything. This is the easiest thing. And this is a broker fee apartment. Mm -hmm. Now, I know with broker fees, I know real estate agents got to get paid. I get it. And you know what? I'm all for paying the full 15% broker fee when the real estate agent does work. I believe, I believe that they should get the full fee all the time. In this case, I told the apartment I was, I was basically ready to fill out everything right now. So I said, is there anything we can do about the pricing of this fee? This would have taken him no more than probably two hours of his time. He said, I can't lower the fee. I was like, look, man, I know all real estate agents eventually in Manhattan during this time it was a slow month. It was four months ago or whatever. It was like February or January. Usually discount the fee down to one month's rent. I'm going to do that right now. We don't even have to go see the place, blah, blah, blah. He won't discount it. So I told him, I'm not going to go through you. I, find, I called another broker who ended up going and getting the full fee for two hours of work. Right, just because he was nicer to me. But what's the end result here? What's the end result about all these leasing agents, real estate agents? Most real estate agents are focused on the tactics. They're focused on the scarcity. They're focused on getting people to do the sale that they forget about the customer's desires, the customer's what's best for the customer, and all that stuff. They forget about that because they're worried about these tactics. And in the end, what they're doing is they're making me a customer. Ensure I will never go to them again. Well, let's in 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 in. in, in well, there's a few things you touched on there that I, I think are worth ta talking about here because you talk a lot about price and what you write about and this idea of negotiating price down. And, th and this is maybe a, just a unique scenario because it's New York real estate market. Um, when someone goes to DerekHalpern.com, right, or SocialSugars.com, and they and they want to you know work with you as a consultant and say, hey, Derek, can I negotiate the price down to a certain Whatever it is, fifteen percent off, twenty percent off. What are you doing? You know, what's your advice to someone like that? Because because this is something real estate agents. And this, you're touching on a, obviously an important point for them because yes. they're always they're always fighting for the commission, right? You so when someone when someone says that to you, how do you respond? And and how would you advise a real estate agent to overcome that objection? Because this is something that's incredibly important. They've got to justify, and at least in traditional real estate res residential sale, the three percent or whatever else that they're making. So how would you overcome that? If you were on the other side of that, if you were negotiating with Derek Halpern, right, who's saying, hey, let's negotiate this down, how would you respond to yourself in this scenario? Very simple. I'll explain it. So if it's a scenario where they're, I'm basically doing no work, okay, because here's the bottom line. Real estate is changing. There's a lot of real estate agents. If someone like me comes there and just gives you a deal on a platter, mm -hmm. you accept that deal. So taking that, take, well, and just, just to stop you for one second. You know, with real estate agents, they they, they they justify this scenario, a full you know commission on a deal they didn't do a lot of work for because they made a full commission on a deal they did 10 times the work for. So they said it all evens Not out in the wash. Good. You're basically penalizing one customer yep. for the pain of another customer. You should never do that because you're not keeping the customer's best interest in mind. Instead, you have to look at the other customer that caused you that 10 times more amount of work and figure out how to spot him before it becomes into that. That's you know, all about yeah. selection. But I, I want to talk about the negotiating of the rate. Sure. So yep. if someone like me hands you a deal on a platter, yep. and you know and I know that a lot of people settle on the one month, in that scenario you take it. You don't take it if you put in, if you put the time in for three weeks for showing them apartments, you do not negotiate your rate. And I suggest you don't ever negotiate your rate in that scenario. And let me tell you how to get out of it in this specific instance. There's actually some interesting research to back it up too. Uh, they talk about paywalls right now with news with uh, news yep. websites. New right? York Times has it. Boston.com has it. Yep. Let's talk about paywalls. There was a I don't remember who did the study off the top of my head, but there's some research that suggested that when people were presented with the idea of a paywall, all you had to do to make them accept the paywall and be happy about it was elucidate the fact of we are putting this paywall in place. Because if we don't put this paywall in place, we're actually going to go bankrupt, right? If they basically put this, so we're instead of asking everyone to pay a huge, 
monthly fee to get this. We're trying to get, instead of getting a few people to pay a huge monthly fee, yep. we're trying to get a large number of people to pay a very small fee. When this was presented to those people, they were like, you know what? That's totally cool. I get it. Basically, what they're saying is they're trying to put themselves in the position where their customer can understand the fee. When you're a real estate agent, if someone's trying to negotiate your price, a lot of real estate agents get, take it personal. They'll say something like, well, how would you feel if someone tried to discount your rates? Yeah. That's the wrong response because right there you already lost. Instead, what you want to do is you want to just appeal to their emotional side. You want to say something like this. If it's someone that you've worked with, you could say, well, over the last few weeks, we've met up this day, this day, this day. I just have an honest question for you. Let's not talk about the fee right now. I have an honest question for you. Obviously, we're finding the place that you want. We saw 15 or 16 places. Do you feel like I did a good job? I just want to know. Are you happy with my level of service? And then they say yes. I was like, well, one of the reasons why I'm able to give this level of service and devote so much time to each individual customer and do that extra hand holding like I did with you, the reason why I'm able to do this is because I never negotiate my fee in this scenario. Because otherwise it wouldn't be possible for me to give this level of service to you. I would have to try and rush you out the door. And you know what? There are real estate agents out there that get people like you, try to rush them through like three places and try to sign a deal. But in the end, they're just trying to churn and burn each new client. Me, I want to hold your hand and help you find the perfect place because I know that's better for you in the long run and it's better for me because if you leave here and find the perfect place, you're going to be living there for a year, two years, three years. If you're buying a house, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell all your friends about that great experience you had where I helped ensure that you had the best experience possible. And that's only possible because I don't discount my rate. If you say that to a very logical you, person, you know yeah. what they're going to say? They're going to feel embarrassed that they even asked you <laughs> at that point, honestly. They're going to feel embarrassed and they're going to say, you know what? My bad, man. I, you know what? You did show me all these apartments. You did help me find the perfect place. It's my duty to pay you. Yeah, that's and that's a, that's phenomenal advice. And I think anybody who's watching this, and you know, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and I wish I, I wish I remember the name of the designer's name, the guy who uh, created the next logo for uh, for Steve Jobs. And he talked about this cons. They, they tell the story in the in the Steve Jobs biography, Derek, and they're talking about like the moment when Steve Jobs was trying to find a designer, and he and, and Steve Jobs turns to this this old older German gentleman who was like in his eighties or nineties at the time. He's like, okay, he goes, I'm thinking about hiring you as my designer. He goes, uh, you know, could you send me some proofs before before we decide what to move forward? And the designer turns to him and says, the older gentleman says, basically, he goes, I'm going to submit a design. You're either, either going to love it, you're going to hate it. Either way, you're going to pay me. And he had this sort of level of confidence that, you know, instantly made Steve Jobs want to hire this guy and, who designed eventually the next logo. And it not that's not necessarily t totally related to what you're saying, but if you were able to essentially communicate to the person that you know, hey, this is what I'm doing for you. That I've actually taken the time, taken the the, the I, my time, obviously, to go through the process, to take good care of you, to get the get the results you wanted. I'm worth every cent, right? And you've talked a lot about this idea of being worth your hourly rate. You did a study, right? I look, I, I, just, I did my I did my homework for the show. I listened to the to the video. You did a study. You asked your your audience of social triggers, a hundred thousand people or more that follow you online. You said, how many of you? actually think you get paid what you're worth and what was it a hundred percent said no and we deal with that in real estate and we get a we had a guest on a, a while back one of my favorite guests Lee Brown who who talks about this know your worth she says I run an asshole free business and she's exactly describes everything you just said which is if you do your job and you take great care of your customer and you go above and beyond you earn your commission and you earn your worth if you don't there's scenarios like you just described where it makes sense for you to bend without bending on your principles so Derek this whole show is about lead conversion we got off on a lot, a lot of different topics but there's something that I want you to touch on here because for me in real estate we work so incredibly hard to to create content to send out email campaigns to drive people to our websites to actually get the lead right yeah. And at the point when we get the lead or the prospect, whatever you want to call it, that we get the email, the phone number, we reach out to that person, at that moment, right, is where 
there where the magic happens or it doesn't happen. Yeah. So you know the, it, you know there's lots of different uh, ways you can describe it, but at that moment, there's a lot of salespeople who are watching this call right now, and they're asking themselves, "How do I win that moment?" Right? I'll How say do I win that moment in five seconds. You easy. Fuck. So most people accept any client that comes their way, right? Because they're mm -hmm. clients. That's a mistake. What ends up happening when you're ready to accept anyone, you actually end up losing more people than you gain. Instead, what you got to do is this: you want to set the ground rules right from the get-go. You want to tell them right on the phone. They call you. You get them on the phone. You say, "Hey, you introduce yourself." And you're looking for an apartment. You might say. How, when are you trying to move? That's a good question that a lot of real estate agents ask. But you also want to say this. I want to just let you know how I work as a real estate agent, just so we can have it all out there right from the get-go. I believe in helping you find the perfect place. There's a lot of real estate agents out there that will try to just churn and burn you as fast as possible because all they care about is making money. With me, you're right from the get-go, you're letting them know, I care about service. And if you let people know that from day one, minute one, you know what's going to happen? Those people that want that service will love you for it. And when it comes time to get that fee, they're not even going to try to negotiate the fee from you. They're going to want to pay it because you're qualifying them right in the first second by letting them know that you are the type of person that's going to hold their hands through one of the more, most stressful times in their life. I just moved. I just said this. I hated it. I am essentially a stress-free individual. My life is amazing, right? I'm, I'm stress-free. <laughs> when I had to move, I was the most miserable human on earth, right? And it's like, it was funny because I think about moving and I, I was moving easy. I was throwing out all of my furniture. That's the way to go. And, move, and buying all new furniture. Like I was ready to just basically move my clothes and my computer and all I needed was a place. Basically the, the most stress-free move possible, right? And I was stressed out. I can only imagine how other people feel. If you can let them know in the beginning that I'm of service, I'm going to help you out. Perfect. That's the way you do it. Yeah, you know, and, and, and there's you know obviously lots of different ways to do that beyond just the words you say, but the actions you actually do after the point of contact, the follow up, and 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 how you treat that individual, and you know, how, how, it's it, really everything. Because I think actions speak louder than words in a lot of cases where you have thoughtful, considerate marketing even after the fact and they reach out to you. And it, it what's interesting about that, what you just said there is in real estate over the last decade, right, there's been lots of discussions, Derek, about um, listing syndication, right? And, and agents have a certain perception or, or, or ownership, if you will, over their own listings. And this idea of controlling the listings and how they're displayed online is considered to be almost a competitive advantage they have over the competition. But what you just described there is I think the way the world is moving for people in the sales position, which is goes a lot less from controlling information, in this case in real estate, it's listings, moving towards the direction of service. Because that's really, at the end of the day, you can have a great website like socialtriggers.com, really easy to use, find great information, but if you don't have great service on the back end of it, you may be able to attract a lot of clients, but you won't be able to actually convert them into to real clients at that point. Yeah. Um, Malcolm Gladwell said this best. He has a new book coming out later this year, Mm -hmm. called David and Goliath, like basically how underdogs beat Goliath, right? You want to know how David beats Goliath? He basically, yeah, I've seen him speak about this at a conference, uh, and oh, I, I think I also read an article about it, he wrote, and it's now being blown up into a book. David beats Goliath when he fights Goliath by his own rules. Like he doesn't use his Goliath's rules. He creates his own rules to fight Goliath. So he he gives you know look at the example of America taking the taking America from Britain. They weren't lining up in line rank and file and just shooting at Britain. They couldn't win that fight. They did guerrilla mm -hmm. warfare. That's how they won. David beat Goliath by creating their own rules. The same applies to real estate agents. If you can't, you can sit here and complain about the listings all you want, and you can say how you don't have access to the listings. This Goliath has access to this. This is not fair. You can whine about it. But you know what? You can't control that. What you can control is how you treat your customers. If you treat them well, they're going to be happy to pay you more money for it. Especially That's now, when I, I told you, I, I, I dealt with three real estate agents 
in Manhattan. Three. Yeah. The first one tried. The first one lied to me and tried to scam <laughs> me. The second one lied to me and tried to scam me. I mean, we're talking about the fear, or whatever. I didn't tell you about how actually the apartment that I wanted in the building was two floors lower than the apartment he was trying to sell me because the he told me he couldn't show me that apartment below the apartment and was trying to get me in the higher one. And I asked him why. He goes, well, I can't show you that one below you. I come to find out later that he actually breached his fiduciary duty. And he didn't show me that apartment below the other apartment because it was someone else's exclusive and he didn't want to co-broke it. So yeah. this is an example where he shot himself in the foot. That was, that was like the straw that beat the camel, you know, broke the camel's sure. back and I went to the other person that had the exclusive on the apartment and told him right off the gate, I was like, look, I know you breached your fiduciary responsibility. I'm not going to co-broke this with you. You're going to be pissed off, but if you want to, you know, we're, we're not, I'm not going through you. And I went to someone else. Well, you know, in, in, in this is, uh, in, in that example, and again, this may sound obvious, but the, the, you have to understand, Derek, I think in our, in our industry specifically, um, we can't go to a real estate conference or an event without someone giving 10 tips on how to maximize Pinterest for your business. And everything you're talking about right now is really a lot, as you just talked about, strategy, not tactics, right? And yeah. building, building a great business. And these things are incredibly important. And again, it, it, it relates very directly to lead conversion, which is lead conversion, whether it's a phone call, an email, a Facebook message, whatever it is, it's that first moment when you reach out to the person, what's that experience like? And as Derek's talking about right now, guys, actually taking the time to differentiate yourself by saying this is where you stand this is who you work with and if they want a real estate agent who's just gonna basically just send them listings and never talk to them then that's probably not your client and you don't you know that's not a bad thing so Derek last question I have for you today and I'm gonna make sure that we plug social triggers again because I want people to actually follow you because again I've immersed myself in this stuff and I feel much smarter because of it and I've used some of your tactics the last email campaign we just sent out for the show this, the, tonight which I'll check the, the data on I'll share with you afterwards last question I have for you tonight um, real estate agents, uh, and we've been taught this for many years, is it's all about growing your database, right? Growing yeah. your database uh, because you know the cost to acquire a customer versus the cost to keep a customer is significantly less. We've seen data on that, of course. Uh, many real estate agents do a terrible job at staying in touch with the Derek Helpins of the world after we actually you know sell you the apartment or sell you the the, the condo, whatever it is. What is your advice and recommendations for if I want to if I want to keep you engaged, I want to continue to build trust, I want to keep you as a client for life, and, and get you to refer me to all of your other friends? What? How should I market to you to to achieve just that? Yeah, I, you know, this is gonna sound cheesy, but do the regular stuff like send cards on birthdays and on and, and on uh, holidays. Yeah, that's great. Uh, just a quick little story. I have a personal tailor that I used. He came to my place, did some tailoring for me. I had forgot about him. July 4th came. He sent me a text message reminding me that he existed. And I actually brought him in and I hired him as a stylist to just go out and buy all this stuff. I basically paid him to do $1,000 to go buy clothes for me. Because he reminded me he existed with a simple text message on the July 4th saying happy 4th of July. So you want to keep in touch. The point is to just keep in touch with them but not too in touch with them because it might seem a little weird, right? So keep in touch with them, but you can also go an extra mile. You can throw a party. You can be like, all right, you know what? I, I, I go through socialtriggers.com. When you're on the social triggers mailing list, I occasionally email out that I'm having an open bar party in Manhattan or Seattle, and I invite people to come out and just have some drinks for some open bar for an hour, and it costs me a lot of money to do this. But what happens is, it gets people, it shows people that you're taking that extra initiative, one. Two, when they get invited to that party, I don't let ever, anyone come. I say I've only got like say 50 spots or 100 spots. They get in and I'll then say, why don't you bring a friend who you might think might benefit from being a part of the social triggers community. And now they're bringing friends to this little networking meetup. Mm -hmm. And if you do something cool like that for your past people, guess what? They're going to love it. Also, to maintain the whole service thing, yep. there's other things you can do to keep in contact with the new sale to demonstrate good service. After they move in, right? don't just never talk to them again. Instead, maybe at one month into the thing, pick up the phone, call them up. Hey, 
I'm your real estate agent. I helped you find that place that you're currently living in. How's it going? You know, you know, kind of you, you know who gave that exact same advice like three oh. weeks ago? Gary Vaynerchuk, who was on the show. He said, oh, really? he goes, if you want to make more money, he goes, pick up every every single, he'll be on the show, and it was a great show, and this one's, you know, is up there absolutely with the top, you know, the best of them. He said the exact same thing, Derek. He said, if you want to make more money, look back the last three years, pick up the phone, and call every single client you close on. And that's a difficult thing in reality, right? Because just like we talked about earlier, hey, blog, and you'll make more money. Create content, you'll make more money. Picking up the phone and calling someone who you closed with two years ago is actually somewhat of a difficult thing to kind of overcome that. And, and I said that's my last question, but this is actually my last question. If there is a situation where you've lost touch with a client, right? Because a lot of people watch the show right now have a database, Derek, of 300 people, 400 people, and they said, shit, I, I haven't followed up in two years with people. If I call them out of the blue, it's going to be creepy, right? So what's your advice if you are trying to reestablish a relationship with somebody uh, that you've lost touch with? Take one thing I'm going to say. I'd say just do it. <laughs> Make it useful. Make it useful. Yeah. Let's say you got them two years ago. Maybe you got some stats that you're supposed to have your boiler thing checked in two years. Mm -hmm. You could say when you moved into that, you got a new boiler. At the two-year mark, you're supposed to have it checked. I don't personally <laughs> fix your boiler. I just wanted to give you a call. I have a little note in my calendar just to remind you just in case you didn't know about this. Now you're yeah. calling someone out of the blue. They're going to think it's weird, and they're going to say, look, this guy's not selling me anything. He's just letting me know i got to check my boiler. Mm -hmm. And what's that? It's useful. It's useful. Or if you if you if you if you if you lead with usefulness is what you're saying. If you lead with usefulness, n like nothing bad will happen. Only good things will happen. Because at the very minimum, they're going to be like, "Hey, thanks a lot." And even if they don't do business with you, it's it will still be at least worth the energy and effort. And it's they funny. Might be and it, weird too. They might be like, you know what? I haven't heard from this guy in two years. And you know what? The bottom line is, you're already messed up. You haven't. Heard, they haven't heard from you in two years. But the best way to rekindle that relationship is not by saying, "Hey, do you have any real estate you need me to sell?" No, you just call them up and be like, hey, check your boiler, or maybe at this mark, this gutter might be like, give them something that they can use, and yeah. don't ask them for anything. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to remember that, and when it comes time, you just rekindle that friendship, that or that relationship, and when they need someone again, they're going to remember you, because they're like, you know what, that was weird, but you know what, I'll get that looked at. And even if he did get it looked at, they're going to be like, oh, shit, that's so real estate agent never called me in my life. This is great. Yeah, it's it's it, it, you you win every time you do that. And hey, Michelle, I'm looking at the Twitter feed right now. Michelle, thank you. The the name of the designer for my for my Apple story, which didn't really connect with their group saying was Paul Rand, which is a, a great designer. So uh, and there's one thing I want to just to mention because Derek just reminded me of this is uh, he talked about inviting people to a party wherever he's at to basically say, hey, if you know someone who could be a part of us, I only have a certain amount of tickets. Come to the city or come to this bar, and you know we're hosting a live event. The guy who us uh, uh, run Hub, HubSpot, I can never remember his damn name, uh, but the the founder of HubSpot actually does this with lunch, where he randomly invites people to lunch. And the guy is a data freak, and he tracks every single thing in his business with HubSpot as well as his personal business. And he's tracked like about a hundred thousand dollars worth of lunches to about like ten million dollars of revenue for the company. So the idea of this serendipitous type of like, let's just do an event, invite people that you might know. That's a great networking opportunity that real estate agents should absolutely take care, you know, take advantage of. Uh, Derek, listen, man, this has been an amazing show for me. I, you know, I'm a big fan of you. I'm a big fan of social triggers. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Everyone who's watching right now, you guys can connect with Derek at uh, on Twitter at at Derek Helper, and I'll tweet it out in a minute on the pound uh, water cooler hashtag. Uh, you guys subscribe to his blog, subscribe to his site. Uh, it's uh, socialtriggers.com. Phenomenal content. It's absolutely relatable to our industry. It will help you guys generate more leads, make more money, and create a better customer experience for all the people you work with. Derek, man, thanks so much for being on the show tonight. And again, uh, you know, if anything else you need for us, let us know. Hey, thanks for having me. Can I just say one thing? You Absolutely. You one thing very interesting about how I don't talk about Pinterest tips or any of this junk. You know what's real strange about that? I'm 28. I should be engulfed in this technology. And i got to say, it's not the answer. Yeah, it helps. But you know what? People have to get back to basics because most people can't even do that right. You know, you bring up the perfect blog post. Great strategy. Let's yeah, focus you... on creating something useful first. 
<laughs> then let's worry about let's worry about the useful content. Then let's worry about the SEO. Let's worry about the useful. Let's worry about treating your customer right. Then let's worry about when to call them. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's, it's excellent advice, and there's and there's, and there's absolutely. Um, there's never too many times you can reinforce the basics what you're talking about because you know and just one last note here you uh, you would talk about like getting back to the basics and treating your customers right Chris and I have pulled a lot of data recently last month about how many emails people respond to when they get inquired online how many phone calls they actually answer and I'll tell you right now there's some great data on this uh, that's like some publications out there that produce it I've looked at this data and 75 percent of the phone calls that are coming in to, to real estate agents they're not answering the phone call. So you know when we talk about the perfect blog post, um, I feel a little bit uh, bad that I brought that up now that you know now that we kind of put it into context here because I think the rate the way to create a great experience and actually get more customers and convert more leads is maybe just to pick up your phone. Um, that may be where to start. So yes. so yeah. on that note, on that note, Derek. Hey man, thanks again for being on the show and uh, you know hope to have you again on in the future. Hey, thanks for having me. It was fun. Absolutely, Derek. Take care.